Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Uh, welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure, also known as CES. Uh, we're continuing our study of the book of Ephesians, and we're getting to a very interesting part of the scriptures. Uh, we're on chapter two. Is it verse three or four we're on beginning with? We're on three, but we, you can always do a recap of two. Okay. Uh, so get your Bibles ready, and we'll start in just a second. Uh, Let's say hello to the congregation, though, first, and we'll start with uh, the notorious Untwisted Sister. <laughs> my my, uh, my uh, reputation precedes me. <laughs> <laughs> hey there, beloved saints. I am looking forward to studying the scriptures with you tonight. Uh, this is something I look forward to all week. I really, really love our Bible studies. Good to see you. Amen to that. Okay, Brother Cripps, want to say hi? Well, sure. Uh, so quick, I was like, I usually should go on a little bit more than that. I have time to prepare my statement. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm glad to be here. My uh, One of my favorite days of the week, which is Wednesday, when we uh, dive into the Word. So I'm excited about that. And I hope everyone in the chat is doing well tonight. And this is a, a very uh, important part of uh scripture this this uh these verses we're going to go over tonight in galatians so um i'm excited and ready to get started thanks yeah well you you know we're in ephesians but you said galatians it was oh i did i did say yeah. galatians yeah, yeah sorry about that but you know I, that happens to everybody and sometimes people will use that against us too uh, uh he doesn't yeah. even know what what chapter they're in yeah <laughs> But we all uh, misspeak sometimes. We think one thing and a different word comes out. So I am sure. Uh, uh, yeah, we're in Ephesians. And let's look at the chat room and say hello to everybody. Uh, this uh, David Conlin, uh, welcome. Renee's been telling us about you. Blessings to you. And uh, welcome to the congregation. Um, if you are here for the first time or, or you're new to CES, uh, I, I hope you enjoy your time with us tonight. You can also join us on Sundays for our church service at 5 p.m. Eastern. And every Friday night, we have a lot of fun. It's called Fun Fellowship Friday, 9.30 Eastern time. So join us for all those programs. Um, all right, uh, Ben, why don't you say hello to everybody? Hello, everyone. It's good to be here once again on Wednesday and studying the word with everyone. It's always a, a, great, a great blessing. So looking forward to it. Mm-hmm. Okay, amen. All right, nothing, no reason why we can't go into the scriptures now. So, yeah, I, put, I got my uh, wolf outfit for you, Luke, because you didn't see it earlier. Yeah, let me see it. I'm a sheep in wolf's clothing. <laughs> <laughs> That's <is> funny. <laughs> actually, you know, actually, let me see it again. I freeze it on her, will you, Ben? See, wolf head. Yeah. Uh, look at us. Look up a little higher. Look at it. Look up higher. So, oh yeah, yeah, good man. You look good with that. Yep. It's, it's, it's like a hat. You got the paws and everything. Yep. Yeah, it's really a uh, wow. Very well, cute. I, I always love it when women wear hats. I don't know what it is about them, but uh, I think they they enhance a woman's appearance to wear a hat. Well, you probably remember it. You're probably. I you were probably a kid when men wore men and women wore hats more prominently than than not. I've always yeah. loved it. I was uh, I always wore uh, 30s and 40s clothing when I lived in LA. I oh, always I love that. hats with the veils and the I love I love that stuff. Yeah, people were more stylish back then. Yeah, they sure were. Dapper Dan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Remember that word, Dapper Dan? Yes, I do. I've never been called that. <laughs> <laughs> no, me neither. Me neither. Okay, um, let me read. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're on verse three, but I'm going to read two, one, two, and three together. Uh, Renee, get ready. All uh, right. In, in the KJV, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts, the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling 
the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Yeah, we want to go back to chapter one at the very end there, because it's kind of a continuing thought with and you. So we just go back and he says, as a, and has put all things under his feet, talking about Jesus, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And you, which he hath quickened. So <clears throat> quicken there means to be brought to life. Uh, you've heard the term the quick and the dead. It means the living and the dead. So you, as he brought to life, quickened, who were dead. Uh, this is another part of our eternal security because uh, we are born again of incorruptible seed, like Peter says. Uh, so the, our salvation is an, a birth event. And so you were dead, uh, but you've been quick and brought to life. You were dead in trespasses and sins where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. I want to be clear here that Paul is confirming we are children of God. We are not children of disobedience. Children of disobedience are those that have not obeyed the gospel, meaning those that have not believed. So Paul here is saying, you know, based on your identity in Christ, you did walk that way when you were dead in trespass and sins because you only lived of the flesh. That's all you had. You didn't have the spirit. You were dead in trespasses and sins. And that's how you walked. Uh, and that motivation, what motivates the world is the prince of the power of the air. So Satan himself um according to the prince of the power, the spirit that worketh in the children. So Satan himself, it's his spirit uh, that works in the children of disobedience. So he's dividing uh, how we were when we were dead, what was moving us uh, in all of our choices uh, versus what moves us now that we're alive in Christ. Awesome. You missed my amen because I was muted. Okay. <laughs> All right, Brother Cripps, uh, let me uh, read that in the Amplified before you comment. Uh, it says, uh, in verse 3 in the Amplified, Among these unbelievers, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, our behavior governed by the sinful self, indulging the desires of human nature without the Holy Spirit, and the impulses of the sinful mind. We were by nature children under the sentence of God's wrath, just like the rest of mankind. Hmm. Well, it seems like the Amplified agrees with the, Rene, uh, the way Rene qualified that by saying uh, that these are unbelievers that he's talking about. He's talking about, uh, in my opinion, past tense. I'm gonna just start saying in my opinion, just so it, it keeps things clear. Uh, in my opinion, it's uh, it's definitely talking about unbelievers in the past, and uh, we don't have to worry about that anymore. Uh, we are made alive. Our spirit is quickened. We have a different spirit. Uh, as we've said several times, of course, you still have that pesky flesh to carry around, and if you're walking in that or responding in that, uh, uh, making choices from the flesh, then, then yeah, it can... I would even say it can look like uh, it can obscure the, the the way that your your spirit actually is the true nature of who you are if you're walking in that flesh uh, and I, and we're going to get into uh, more uh, Paul's going to get into more what that looks like but yeah at this point he's uh, in verse one two and uh, first one uh, is present tense and you hath you hath he quickened well I guess it's past tense too. Uh, he's saying now, though, your spirit is quickened, but then he goes to the past just to make the point where in time past, you walked according to the course of the world. They did. We did before we're saved. That's what we did. Uh, we're under, whether we know it or not, we're under the prince of the power of the air, according to Paul. Uh, but that's the, the that spirit still works in the un, in unbelievers, but it doesn't work in those that are saved. So 
good stuff. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, well, you know, it's always important to uh, ask um, who's talking, who are they talking to, uh, uh, wh- what's the main theme that, uh, that is being communicated. See, th- there's a lot of ways interpreting scripture, but really the, the first and foremost, before you interpret it spiritually or, uh, you know, personally, mm-hmm. uh, based on your own life's experiences, the first thing we have to do is uh, interpret it in the light of what was the intention of the writer at the time? So uh, he's talking to a church in Ephesus in Turkey, that, that uh, and and here he's at the point where he's talking about how uh, you're believers, but re- let's think back about before you believe that your state you you are dead spiritually, but of course now your spirit was brought to life. So that's the context talking to people who are. Uh, regenerated, uh, spiritually alive believers, but he's reflecting on this is what you were before, though, uh, right. uh, children of disobedience. And uh, another way for ch- saying children of disobedience, uh, in other places it calls children of the devil. And, and this offends a lot of people. I'm sorry, but, you know, I, it, all I can do is tell you what the Bible says. And if it, if it hurts, I'm sorry about it. But uh, the Bible does tell us that uh, until we're born again, we are all children of the devil. Right. And the only way you're going to become a child of God is with a new birth. Uh, I like the way Dr. Ruckman expressed it. He says, when you're born from your mother's womb, you are born wrong. That's why you need to be born again uh, to uh, correct the, the first birth. The first birth, we we're born uh, with a, a dead spirit. And so the new birth is what uh, it, what gets quickened, what gets brought to life. Well, our body is already living. Our soul or mind is already functioning. So what's dead that needs to be quickened? Your spirit. Mm-hmm. And that's what it says here. In the Amplified, in verse 1, it says, And you, he made alive when you were spiritually dead and separated from him because of your transgressions and sins. Uh, so that's the point we're at. And he's reflecting now on, let's think back to the time before you were saved. This was your state. Okay. Uh, we'll go on. Any, any more, though, before we go to the next verse? No, sir. That's good. Okay. Brother Cripps, you get to go first on verse four. I'll read verse. Wow. You know how Paul is. I don't know how many verses I need to read. To, <laughs> let me see how, how much sense it makes just with verse four. It says, but God, who is rich in mercy... For his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace, ye are saved. Yeah, I'll stop there. First four and five, Brother Cripps. Yeah, that's good. That's plenty plenty good stuff for me to comment on. Uh, uh, Paul refers to this too, and in, in again, my favorite, one of my favorite passages in Scripture, Romans 5, uh, 1 through 8. Uh, While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So in verse five, he's he's saying a similar thing. Even when we were dead in sins, we we're dead. Uh, Adam and Eve did the first sin. Everyone born after that was, uh, unfortunately, whether they wanted to be or not, that's the state that they were born in, born dead in sins. Uh, and God hath quickened us together with Christ. Uh, it's it's by what Christ did that we're saved in the first place. Uh, and in parentheses, it says, by grace are you saved. Yes, that's because we don't deserve it. Uh, the grace we're given, we, we come through Christ, the grace we're given, it means that it's undeserved. Grace isn't given to people, well, you deserve grace, so I'm giving it to you. No, when you, when you have grace, uh, at least when referring to sinners, we don't deserve it. I'm a sinner. Uh, it's, it's, it's by grace that I'm even saved, that my spirit was quickened. It's not because I'm some great dude. I'm not. Uh, in fact, when I walk in my flesh, I'm, I'm not great. I, I, not at all. Uh, so I have to, uh, daily, I have to daily make a decision. And, okay. Today I'm going with, with God's, by God's grace and with the help of the Holy spirit, I'm going to choose to walk in, in my spirit, in that quickened spirit, instead of in that, uh, pesky flesh. Now, eventually at the end, God will take that flesh away from us and we'll be perfect. And what a great day that'll be. We'll be completely perfect. Our body will be amazing. Uh, and that spirit that's been quickened will, will uh, match the body. 
I don't know exactly what we're going to look like or what our attributes are going to be, but it says we're going to be like Jesus. He's the first fruits of what we're going to receive. And we know a few things that he could do. I think we've touched on that uh, on one, one broadcast, but these are some great things uh, to look forward to. Um, and one more thing, this, this uh, phrase, but God, I've heard uh, people do a lot with this, with Facebook memes and stuff. It's like, they'll say my life was this and this and horrible things, and this whole list of horrible things. And then, then it'll go dot, 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 but God. And they get that, apparently got that from Paul. Uh, uh, Paul talks about the former state and the way things used to be. And then he's, in verse 4, he says, but God. And he could have done ellipsis, 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 but he didn't. He just used a comma, or the translators did at least. Uh, but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love. That's why God wanted to reconcile us to himself. And so it's in his great mercy that he sent his son into this world uh, to, to save us um, we're, uh, because of his, his great love for us. Uh, and that's important to remember, regardless of what anyone says, God does love us. Uh, he even loves the unsaved. He wishes, in John 3, 16, he wishes that all would come to repentance. Uh, so I believe that. I believe that that he, he loves us. Amen. Cool. Amen. All right, Sister Renee. You ended at five, right? Yeah. Okay. So... You know, he's talking about uh, the spirit that works as the children of disobedience, among whom also we had our conversation in time passing the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh and of the mind. Again, without the Holy Spirit, that's all we have is flesh. That's all we can feed. We think we're good, but even our good is motivated by selfish uh, desires or so, some kind of uh, selfishness. Uh, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So Paul is reminding us that we were dead. We walk just like everybody else. Uh, we're, we're not above them. And that when we were dead in trespasses and sin, we were by nature the children of wrath. Uh, so we were under God's wrath, even as others. But God... Is a, now I can't get that out of my head because Chris was a dumb <laughs> God. But God, and now I'm thinking of all the memes I saw. Okay. <laughs> it's like, you know, once you see the hang in there, kitty, on the wall, you can't stop thinking about it. Okay. <laughs> but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins. Okay, that, that's important because so many people have this crazy religious mentality. That God will only save you or God only loves you or God only forgives you because you did something to deserve it. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, you've got to repent of your sins as if your sinful flesh could repent of what it is. It, it's not possible to do that. What happened was you were dead in trespasses and sins. Then he brought you to life. Now you're a new person. There's no you don't have to consciously say, I'm going to repent of this and that because you were dead, leave all that dead mess along with your dead flesh and be alive in Christ starting today right here. We're going to walk that out. It's not some process where you make a promise and all that. So uh, right here, it's telling us that we were dead, that even when we were dead in sins, has he quickened us together by Christ, by with Christ, by grace are you saved? So he reminds that we didn't do anything. We weren't reaching out to him. We weren't trying to be good. We weren't, you know, doing anything that made God respond to us to to say, "Hey, they're really trying. I'm going to save them." Amen. They're we're dead in trespasses and sin. And in other places, while we were yet his enemy, we were his enemies. Jesus died for his enemies. Paul mentions, you know, sometimes people might die for a righteous man, mm -hmm. but he died for ungodly ones. So even when we were dead and said, has quickened us together with Christ. He gave us life and we, there was nothing. This should show you right here. You got nothing to offer God. Mm. What do dead men have to offer God? 
What does a dead person have to, you were completely helpless. All of us were, we were dead in sins and he quickened us together with Christ because we're saved by grace. And he's rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Not because we did anything. Mm. Amen. Yeah. Right. yeah. Well, you, you, you both uh, mentioned the idea that uh, uh, even people who are not saved and even us before we were saved, while we were yet still sinners, uh, God demonstrated his love toward us. He commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So this is a, an important thing to understand, uh, and it's a, a very common false teaching. I, you, you may know that I've worked with a lot of street preachers in the past. Yep. It's very common that the street preachers will tell the crowd uh, that uh, God hates them. Uh, God, oh. someone, someone will say, "Doesn't God isn't God love? Doesn't God love love us?" Mm -hmm. And you know, the preacher says, "No, God hates you. God doesn't love you." Uh, so uh, the scriptures are, are clear, though. Uh, this one here. Well, let me read these verses in the uh, Amplified first, verse four and five. But God, being so very rich in mercy, because of His great and wonderful love with which he loved us, even when we were spiritually dead and separated from him because of our sins. He made us spiritually alive together with Christ, for by his grace, his that is, his undeserved favor and mercy, you have been saved from God's judgment. So, uh, yeah, they, uh, they amplified that beautifully. And it is very important for people to understand, especially when we, we are preaching the gospel and we get into, uh, you know, answering their questions in a dialogue. Oftentimes people uh, will say, well, I've been told that God hates uh, hates me uh, if you're not a Christian. And, and uh, people, um, they have to be attracted to God. Uh, people are not attracted to a God that hates everybody until you, until you believe in him. They're not attracted to a God, I think, that, that would actually... To say anybody who doesn't believe in me and receive me as their God and Savior, uh, I'm going to torture them with fire forever and ever and ever. And well, most people say, wow, that's not a very appealing God. It's not that we, I, I'm not saying that we should change who God is and change the, try to change the scriptures. If that's what it says, then that's what it is. I don't think the scripture supports that viewpoint of eternal torment. But the point I'm making is, and also in Calvinism, the, the, if we tell someone that um, uh, God is only going to s uh, select a, a handful of people to, to have eternal life and go to heaven, right. and uh, you, there's nothing you can do about it. You cannot uh, love him. You cannot uh, desire him. You right. cannot believe in him uh, unless he... It selects you and puts and, and imposes that on you. Uh, they'll say, "Well, that's quite unfair. Why, how could he hold uh, all these sins against me uh, if uh, he won't even let me believe?" Uh, and also, the Calvinists say, uh, "Everything you do, God's controlling you like a puppet. Wow. Every 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 bad foul word, every every uh, uh, time you cursed God and mocked God. Guess what?" God put those words in your mouth. God made you say those things. That's Calvinism. So uh, the world as a whole, when we they see, they hear that God hates you, God's going to torture you forever, and and you can't believe, you can't even be a believer because God won't let you be one. Ha <laughs> ha! Uh, let He pick you, and then and then you better hope He picks you. And so those that representation of God, which is not really the God of the Bible, that repels people the world as whole is not attracted to that but this is the god people are attracted to the real god even when we were spiritually dead and separated from him because of our sins he made us spiritually alive together with christ for his grace uh, but because of his wonderful love so he loves everybody even though uh we're, we're sinners and then when we get saved of course he, still, he loves us, but now we have a different relationship. Instead of being children of disobedience, now we're children of God. All right. Um, shall we uh, Shall we say more or go forward? Anyone? We can go forward. 
All right, let's go to verse six. And uh, let me see, uh, Brother Cripps, I think you go first on this. I'll go read six and seven. It's actually Renee's. I went first. Uh, oh. All right, okay, Renee. Renee, thank you, Cripps. I'll, I'll read uh, six and seven together, Renee. It says, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, mm. that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Yeah, I'm doing a video now of all the impossible things we'd have to do to lose salvation. I'm huh. editing it together. So, you know, the, the big one is, well, you have to make God a liar, you know, to you've got to make God an abortionist who aborts his children after they're born. And this one here tells us, He's raised us together. So we were dead in sins. He's quickened us to brought us to life together with Christ. Because by grace are you saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So they also got to drag us out of heaven. That's another thing you got to do to lose salvation. You got to drag yourself out of the heavenly places that we're sitting in Christ Jesus. Uh, but it says he's raised us together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So um, I, I love how we're already seated in heavenly places. And it's because we're in Christ Jesus. He's at the right hand of the Father and we're in him. And I think this is a spiritual truth. That we are in Christ. People don't realize like how permanent our position is in Christ. You know, I like to say rather than OSAS, I like to say once in Christ, always in Christ. Oh, I like that. You believe being in Christ. You're one with him. Hmm. So uh, right. I think this is a, a great verse for that, showing our permanence. And it's God's will that he shows us this. It's like his joy. It's like God's pleasure in, in the ages to come that he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ. It's like God wants so much to just shower us with love, grace, and kindness, and mercy. It's like he, people just, they think God just, hates us and wants to and can't wait for us to mess up so he can punish us. It's just a terrible, terrible view of our father. Cosmic whack-a-mole, Renee. Yes, that's it. That's it. Or whack-a-wolf. Yeah. Well, in our case, if it's if it's a believer, it'd be whack a sheep. Whack a sheep. That's right. Like, oh, you messed up again, Crips. Bang. Whack. Bang on the head. Yeah. Whack you. <laughs> Well, there are some believers that say that God will break our legs. Wow. You've heard wow. that, right? Yeah. Because yeah. We're, we're, we're sheep. If we're his sheep, then he'll when we mess up, he'll break our legs. Keep us from straying. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Oh, no, I thought uh, actually he picks us up and carries us on his shoulder. Yes. Thank you, Renee. Yeah. That's the picture. The picture is he comes out even for one. Even for one lost sheep, he leaves the 99 and goes and saves that one that's lost. Come on. I mean, it should tell you their view of Jesus to picture him with a sledgehammer breaking the kneecaps of his sheep. Yeah, you know, that should awful. show you the wrong Jesus they got. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me read the uh, six and seven in the Amplified, Brother Cripps. Uh, it says, um, and he raised us up together with him when we believed and seated us with him in the heavenly places because we are in Christ Jesus. And he did this so that in the ages to come, he might clearly show the immeasurable and unsurpassed riches of his grace in his kindness toward us mm -hmm. in Christ Jesus by providing for our redemption. Wow. I agree with all that. The Amplified says. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I love the way Renee uh, uh, classified that as we're in Christ. So it, when when that spirit is quickened and we uh, accept what Christ has done for us, no part of ourselves, we're not adding anything of ourselves to the scenario at all. It's just what he did. We've got nothing to bring to the table. I mean, I've said that before, and that's what I believe. 
Uh, it's all what he, he does in us. Uh, we don't have any power to do anything. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. Uh, I do agree that is a future thing. Uh, but, uh, Renee, correct me if my clarification is wrong. You're saying we already have that, not that we're already there. Uh, but because of that promise, we can count on it as if we're already there. Is that, is that, would you say that's accurate? Uh, kind of, but in a way we are already there because we're in Christ and he's there. Right. Okay. Well, I was going to go a step further. And before I, I, I've mentioned this before, uh, and, and this isn't, uh, this isn't a belief I get from scripture, uh, at all. This is my opinion, but I think, uh, because God is outside of time, uh, I believe that that realm is outside of time as well. And it, it could be possible that, uh, we are seated there. And I've mentioned yeah, this before. I get, I get it. I'm with yeah. you on that. Okay. Now that's my opinion. So any, anybody listening, I, that's just, uh, I'm just, uh, theorizing here. Uh, okay. So, uh, that in the ages to come, he might show his exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness. I, I love the way the Amplified goes on and on to talk about his character. Like uh, for the verse above, it says, so very rich in mercy. It has the so very uh, for by his, uh, uh, where's the other one? I can't, well, I'm not going to try to do it. I can't, I can't see it, but um, it's just going on and on about the character of God, which in its essence, is love for us. It's not condemnation. He didn't come to condemn us. He came to save us. That's his purpose and reconciliation. God wanted to reconcile us to God, to reconcile us to himself. And he sent his son. He wanted to do that so badly because we can't do it. Again, if we could do it, if we had the power to do it ourselves, then there would have been a way to do that. We could have done that in some way, but we can't. So we have to rely on what he did only. Hey, Chris. Yep. You know, you were talking about, uh, you know, you believe he's outside of time. And it's very possible that we're literally seated there. And I, I totally get it. I'm with you on that. I have also said, because we're outside of time, you know, <laughs> I was saying that Jesus in the Old Testament, when he showed up, he was in a physical form. You know, yeah. he was down on with Abraham. I said, now, I don't know if that was his glorified body that he sat down on ate with him. Or if he just chose another form to be with, right? So I was accused because I said he's outside of time that I, that Jesus was a time traveler, went back in time and, and ate with Abraham. So wow. it's really difficult to wow. talk about these deeper matters, but I totally get what you're saying. Just like Jesus is God, yet he prays to God. It is the mystery of godliness. And it's not understood without the Holy Spirit, I don't think. Right. So I appreciate what you're saying there. Well, thank I, you. I, to say, I get what you're saying. Thank you, Renee. I, I, I even think that uh, the revelation, when John goes up there to see all these things, I think it's at, he, God is showing him at the actual events, not some uh, computer screen or, you know, whatever, or uh or some kind of dream or vision. It, I mean, it is a vision to John, obviously, but I think spiritually he's actually there. He's seeing these things. I even think that he could have seen himself seated on one of the thrones or, or somewhere in the in the vicinity. I don't know. It's just a theory. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I want to hear more, Brother Cripps, uh, about your your position that uh, you just expressed, uh, get more details on that. But uh, I've never understood um, how we're already seated in heavenly places. Uh, I just believe it because uh, the Bible says it. And there's a lot of things that it says, and I don't understand how, but I just trust that it's true. But I do like what Renee said and, I, and the way it's expressed in the uh, Amplified, it kind of made it make more sense to me in that uh, it says, um, let me see, that was six and seven. Um, and and he raises up together with him, when we believe, and seated us with him in heavenly places because we are in Christ Jesus. 
See, so it, uh, it actually in, it amplified the words because we are. So if I read without that, it says, and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But it says because we are in Christ Jesus. So that's yeah. their way of making this make sense. Since Christ is there and we are in Christ, then we're already seated in heavenly places because we're in Christ. Mm -hmm. That is a way that it obviously it should make sense to anybody. Now, if there's another way that we're there, uh, I'd love to hear about it. I'm not ruling that out at all. But uh, this idea, of this uh, love of God, is uh, it's it's the most attractive thing about Christianity to me. Yeah. Um, when I re I recall when I was born again, I remember the night it. Uh, I was born again. I don't remember what day exactly. It was some day in December, some evening in December of 1986. But I remember the, the, the moment and the experience of it all. Uh, and what um, drew me and convinced me uh, is that this great love of God, this love that surpasses all understanding. Uh, it's, it's, imagine that God, who created all everything, everything that is, God created it, and whom you understand, even looking into microscopes and seeing the complexity, even in a molecule, even in a cell, that it's it's so amazing, and you expand it. And when you think about what God's creation is, it's just mind-boggling. And yet, out of all that, he loved me so much that he would die for me personally. Even if I was the only one, he was willing to die for me. That great love is what attracted me to Jesus. And the scripture says that we love him because he first loved us. Yes. Well, so that was my reaction. I, when I learned that he loved me first, uh, I couldn't help but love him in return. Amen. And by the way, I believe it says are seated as in present tense. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Uh, anybody want to say more before we go to, uh, you know, eight, nine? I feel like I have to say one more thing, uh, and sure. I'm sure it was just a word you used, but you said uh, talk about my position. I just want to make this very, very clear. I have to. Uh, it's not a position. It's just my opinion, and I thought I, I stated that. I'm not. This is not anything I'm clinging to. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm not. I'm not saying I'm dogmatic about it. It's just. It's just what I think. That's all. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, uh, maybe I should have said your view, viewpoint, how you see it. That would, that would probably be more accurate just to keep yeah. things clear for now. Okay. Yeah, so tell me more about that sometime. But uh, sure. let's, let's move on because um, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, these, these verses here, um, on most people who are, um, share the gospel, uh, these verses are always included in the gospel message. Uh, I, I mean, I would never leave this out uh, in a gospel message. Uh, uh, so let's go. Who's who's first on this one? Uh, I think it's me. Okay. No, no, I just went. Sorry. Okay. Didn't, didn't All right. Me. So, Sister Renee, verse eight and nine: For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves; it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, I am a little confused on these. I, I've never heard these before. So it might take me a minute <laughs> to get it. Uh, it's that wolf costume, Renee. It's, it's on your judgment. It's, uh, the wolf is getting into my brain. Renee, that was hilarious. <laughs> uh, the, let's see. Well, I, I kind of want to break this down. Yeah, please uh, do. Because I, I do want it. The Calvinists like to say, that the gift is faith here. Okay. You take your time. Be as thorough as you want, okay? Yeah. <laughs> because if you break in, in, in English, if you break down a sentence structure, and the reason I'm doing this is because of the Calvinist saying that, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, that the gift is faith. But in a simple English, English sentence structure, uh, you're removing the words, the adverbs, and anything that is uh, describing the prior words. So what you would do here is, for by grace are ye saved, it is the gift of God, not of work. So the gift is salvation here. Uh, I just want to say that 
This is a clear verse that salvation is the gift, just like it says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, there's the but God, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The same here. So by grace are you saved. It is the gift of God. Um, and if we break it down, we're saved by God's grace, meaning what there's, there's, you can see earlier, we were dead. We have nothing to offer God. We're his enemy. We're children of disobedience. And by nature, like Hendricks mentioned, it's by nature, not by, not by action. We're the uh, children of wrath. By nature, we were the children of wrath, just as others. So we were born that way. And so we were dead in trespasses and sins. And so by grace, are we saved? And it's through faith. That's why universalism isn't true. Not because Jesus didn't die for whosoever. Not because Jesus didn't taste for a death for every man, because he did. But because it's by grace are you saved through faith. So faith is the vehicle by which we receive the grace and the gift of eternal life. And so this verse is so important to break down correctly. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. So what, what's not of ourselves? Salvation. Right. Salvation is not of ourselves. It's not of anything we're doing. It doesn't proceed forth from us. Salvation is of the Lord. It's a work of God. That's another reason you can't lose salvation because you'd have to take it out of God's hands and put it back into yours. And we know anything in our hands will screw up. So uh, it, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And what's not of works? Salvation is not of works. And if it was of works, we could boast. And the reason, one of the reasons it's not of works is not only because it's not possible because we can't do it. Um, we can only, uh, God's standards perfection, and we only receive that by the gift of righteousness, imputed righteousness. But uh, if it were by works, we could boast. We could say, hey, I'm saved because I did this, that, and the other. So I think these, t although they're very common verses, I even put this when I, I put a tip for a waitress, I put Ephesians 2, 8, 9 on the ticket um, because it's such a, a great verse. Uh, but we hear it so often, sometimes we don't realize how rich it is yeah. uh, in information. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think you, uh, certainly us as a, as a group uh, discussion, we could take this, these two verses here. I bet we could talk about this for an hour or two easily. Yeah, yeah we could. So there's a lot to it, but uh, so that's why I don't want to rush you. But if you, you know, we'll come back to you again, Renee. But let me get Cripps's answer. I know Ben is eager to talk about these verses here too tonight. So go ahead, Brother Cripps. Uh, you you're gonna read the Amplified or? Oh yeah, let me. Oh yeah, I do want to read the Amplified. <laughs> I think you're gonna like it. Okay. It says, "For it is by grace." That is God's remarkable compassion and favor drawing you to Christ, that you have been saved. And that is actually delivered from judgment and given eternal life through faith. And this salvation is not of yourselves. So you see, they made it clear here that what when it says, and this is talking about salvation, not faith. Right. And so, uh, and this salvation is not of yourselves, not through your own effort but it is the undeserved gracious gift of god not as a result of your works nor your attempt to keep the law so that no one will be able to boast or take credit in any way for his salvation amen that's wonderful yeah um i i i, th I think part of this is because i asked uh, you in a in a conversation over the phone or we were talking about this and i i said that uh i believe Faith is a gift. Uh, I do agree that this verse isn't saying that. This verse is very. This verse to me is very clear the way that it, it's broken up. And again, I think Calvinists take something that may have a little truth to it and they they twist it. They they just they just take it way too far. Um, on another night, perhaps uh, I would I would love to talk about that more because I'm I'm studying that right now. Uh, I I feel like uh, because God opens our eyes and ears and and because we don't we don't have any power in ourselves to do anything it's not not bring anything of our ourselves to the table um 
that everything is a gift. I mean, salvation is a gift, faith is a gift, belief, everything is a gift. Um, but again, because of what the Calvinists have done, that's a very dangerous thing to talk about and, and not be clear. Uh, but so I'll just try to focus on uh, the verses themselves, let uh, scripture speak for itself. And in this one, uh, to me, salvation is, is not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. And how do we get there? We get there through faith. Uh, that's the mechanism or, or the vehicle by which we arrive at, at, at that, at that, at that place. Uh, so, and I, I can't any more clearly state that it's, that it's not of ourselves. And this is the, this is the place where works come in too. You know, people say, well, I've got to do something. And I think we've made it very clear up to this point. Uh, there's nothing we do. It's, it's by grace. And as I said earlier, we don't deserve the grace, but it, it's, God decided that it would be a gift, so he gave it to us, and we get there uh, through faith. So we're not bringing anything of ourselves. And then uh, did you read verse 9, too, not of works, lest any, so I've already, I've already mentioned the works part. Um, if it was of works, then we would be able to boast. And so it, it's kind of a tell for people, uh, at least for me, in discernment, if they're talking about all the things they gave up and you know, in part of their, their testimonies, like, yeah, I gave this up and gave that up. Not every time, but a lot of times you can see that they're, they're focusing more on their works, uh, whether it's something they're doing or something they're not doing, it's still being focused on their works uh, and, and boasting about it. Uh, in my flesh, I, I might boast, but in my spirit, I have nothing to boast about because he did it all. He did every bit of it. I didn't do anything. Okay, thank you. Uh, before I go to Ben, though, let me make a uh, re reference to Nori. Hello, Brother Nori. Uh, there's a comment he made here. It says, in many languages, it is impossible to tie the gift to faith grammatically because it is more specific than our English language that has one gender, LOL. We only have the, that, it, etc. But uh, Nori, uh, when I saw your comment, it reminded me of a video I saw of uh, um, uh, Brother Merle Hanna. Uh, what is his name? Nori Post is the name of the channel. I can't remember it. But uh, just this last week, one of his newest videos, he did a video on this very subject, and I think it's titled Keeping It Simple. And it was really wonderful. It was one of the best presentations I've seen on this very subject, on on uh, is is faith a gift? And this particular scripture is here. So watch that. Uh, let me see. You have that, Nori? Please post that if you will, uh, Brother Merle's uh, channel. And everybody watch that if you if you uh, if you have the time. It'll be very helpful. Uh, but go ahead, Brother Ben. Uh, give us your thoughts on this. Ben? Ben, you with us? Sorry about that. Sorry about that. <laughs> I was talking. Um, yeah, I just wanted to read. Uh, I, I've compiled some uh, study notes of mine. Um, and so I took some different things that I've learned and kind of come to some conclusions about this verse. And I thought I would just read that to you real quick. It shouldn't take long. Um, this verse is, is controversial because... Uh, it, and and because some people would say that no that the the faith is is it's the gift is actually two parts like it's a gift with two two sub gifts almost like okay so the gift is not only eternal salvation but the gift is also the saving faith that that allows you to receive that uh, salvation and the the to determine what what's true it, you know is is it is the gift eternal salvation or is it both faith and uh, eternal salvation. It comes down to the word, how you translate or how you put an emphasis on the word that, where it says, and that not of yourselves. So to determine if this passage is teaching that both a supernatural saving faith and eternal salvation are part of the gift of God, it is critical to determine that the word, what the word that, which is the Greek word tuto, is referring to. Uh, in Greek, that is a neuter, meaning it's not masculine or feminine, and so it's kind of like saying this thing. So like uh, if I said that, it's almost like saying this thing. Um, and, and it's singular. So it's not saying these things. So um, it, so it's a, it's a neuter, singular, demonstrative pronoun. 
pronoun. Being singular, it cannot be referring to multiple things. That's that's the Greek rules that out. So it's either referring to faith being the gift or eternal salvation being the gift. It cannot refer to both a supernatural gift, saving faith, and eternal salvation. Notice that the word gift is singular, indicating that it is not two separate gifts, yet the word works is plural. So if the author intended to communicate that faith and eternal salvation were gifts, it would say gifts in the plural, just like works is in the plural. The Greek rule on pronouns is that they must agree with their, with their antecedent. In this case, it is either you have been saved or faith. So that's what we're trying to get down to. Is, is that referring to you have been saved or is that referring to faith? So again, the Greek rule on pronouns is that they must agree with their antecedents in gender and in number. The antecedent cannot be faith because it is in the feminine. So that of not that so that not of yourselves cannot be referring to faith. In other words, the faith is not is that not of yourselves based on the grammar. And even setting the Greek aside, even in the English, the grammar does not support the assertion that both faith and eternal salvation is a gift from God. For then it would be stating, for grace you have been saved through faith, and that faith is not of yourselves, and that faith is a gift for, from God, and that faith is not of works, lest anyone should boast. So to assert that, that through seeking, which most people would recognize as a work, God eventually grants saving faith, the grammar does not support that because it would read that faith is not of works, in which seeking would be a work. And I think we both people would agree with that. Uh, in the context of eternal salvation, works are always contrasted with grace in Scripture. So again, that is not in reference to faith, but rather in reference to e eternal salvation by grace. So it's con contrasting grace and works. The Greek pronoun tuto commonly takes on a conceptual antecedent, which in this case further supports that the word that in this passage must be referring to faith, but you have been saved. When properly applying that to the, to the proper antecedent, we can then interpret the verse as it was intended. For grace have you been saved through faith, and that salvation is not of yourselves, and that salvation is the gift of God, and that salvation is not of works, lest anyone should boast. And finally, I, I would just appeal to the fact that other verses, and again, I think it's always important when we, when we uh, inform our doctrines that we have two, at least two or three witnesses, and there's no other verse that refers to uh, the gift, again, the gift from God as being faith. So, for example, in Romans 9, 23, it says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift is, is, it says right there, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Um, and again, every verse in the Bible, it, it talks about, whenever it talks about the gift from God, it's always in reference to Christ or the Holy Spirit or justification through faith, uh, or even Christ himself. So um, I thought I would share that, 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 uh, that the exegesis there from the Greek, I think that can be sometimes, sometimes helpful. Also, too, I should mention, um, whenever uh, the word believe in, is, is used in the Bible in terms of uh, a salvific content, it's always in the active voice, not the passive voice. So uh, an active voice would be saying, I hit the ball, whereas an, a passive voice would say, the ball hit me. Uh, so again, you see it's an act of the person, it's a, an act of their volition. And whenever the word believe is used in the Bible in a salvific context, it's always in the active voice, meaning the person exerts their volition. It's not a passive thing where it just happens to you. It's always an act of the will. So I hope you good point. Oh, excellent points. I especially like your point that, uh, uh, that grace uh, works are always contracts with grace, uh, not with faith. Uh, but I, I wanted to, uh, focus on, uh, the verse nine in this, um, see when we say in verse eight, that it is the gift of God. The question is, well, what is it? Is it, grace is it saved is it faith um uh, well uh, i think to to uh, get the right conclusion we have to go to the next verse verse nine it says that whatever it is is not of works now let me ask uh what what is the argument that we get from the, the false gospel the salvation is from works right 
Correct. I'm sorry, I was muted. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean that that's that's the universal argument. All all the religions of the world, all of the sects of Christendom, apart from Christianity, uh, ninety percent of all professing Christians, they believe that salvation is because of your works, because of your righteousness, your your uh, making yourself desirable and, and and acceptable to God by changing your life and doing good works. Well, that's that's the argument that the whole world has is that it's our works. So that's what this portion of scripture is arguing against. No, world, the world as, as a whole, that's what you think, but you're wrong. It, 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 salvation is not of works. It's, it's who is arguing that faith is of works. Now I do believe that there's an error that uh, we need to confront and that is that uh, faith, uh, I believe that it's being taught that faith is of works by, in other words, if you will study long enough in the scriptures, that, that then you will uh, get faith as a, in return for all this study that you put in. And so I believe that is a work system working in order to get that faith. And, but uh, other, than, other than that, uh, I've never heard anybody in history uh, uh, teach that uh, the, the, what is uh, works are um, for faith. No, they argue that works is for salvation. And this says no, works is not for salvation. Right. Otherwise, we could boast if, if we said that uh, we earned it through our works. Yeah, and you can hear that too, Brother Luke. And uh, you're, you're saying uh, uh, other people that have a, a false gospel you can hear that. That's that tell I was telling you about. I was telling you about the tell uh, when they talk about how many things they give, gave up and what they did uh, in their testimony. You know, it, it's more about that than what Christ did. So uh, if you listen to someone long enough, it comes out on what they're putting their faith in. Yeah. Amen. Um, and again, there's, uh, of course, this is a, this is a verse, a uh, portion of scripture where, Calvinists uh, use it uh, uh, and, and twist it to support their uh, uh, evil philosophy of Calvinism. Right. Uh, but uh, there are a couple of channels that we have on our recommended list that are experts at refuting Calvinism. My favorite is Soteriology 101. That's uh, Leighton Flowers. He's a former Calvinist. He uh, 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 teaches it to some seminary. I don't remember his. But go to his channel, and if you look up on that channel, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, he has a video specifically on this and uh, all the other verses that Calvinists are twisting. And it, it, it's a playlist. I don't know if it's a playlist, but it's a category of, ver of videos he makes called decalvinized. In other words, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, decalvinized. Cool. You know, showing you where the Calvinism interpretation is wrong, proving it wrong. Right. So I would suggest you go to, to that. You could also go to Beyond the Fundamentals, another channel that's recommended that is an expert. But so for more information, because you could make videos for hours just on Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. But right. I, think did, I think we did an excellent job. I think Ben made some very good points. And uh, everybody, uh, it should be very clear now that it's inescapable, that uh, what it is, is salvation. Uh, what, what is by or not by works? It's salvation. Yep. No one, no one's going to argue that that faith is coming by works. So why would we? He have to say that. Yeah, I'm. I'm actually glad that this came up, so uh, I could be clear about uh, where I'm coming from as far as what I believe uh, as it pertains to these these uh, two verses here. It's very important for people to understand that. All right. Uh, now. Uh, I made a video, and, and Renee, you made a video with the same title. Are you copycat, or, or did you do, do great minds think alike? Oh, no. we are the greatest <laughs> mind. <laughs> I made a video many years ago. I've been on YouTube for over 12 years now, and this is one of my oldest videos, and it's called The, the Difference Between Must and Should. And uh, I, I say the difference between must and should is, is demonstrated in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. And so... Um, in, in Ephesians 2, 8, it's telling you what you must do, okay? It's faith alone, no works. And, right. and then in Ephesians 2, 10, it's what we should do, okay? And you actually have the word should in, in the verse 10. Yep. So, um, 
Let's uh, let's go to that. Uh, whose turn is it this time to go first? Can I address the fate? We're talking about this. The f there's a, a a a short phrase that work salvationists are using out of context, and it's faith that worketh by love. So they're saying that the actual faith that saves encompasses works, but it's not really works. It's faith that worketh by love. But that phrase is actually referring to what keeps saved people going and serving and living for the Lord? Because the point here is that we don't need law because the law doesn't save. And if you're worried about um, the law needing to motivate us, it's not necessary because it's faith that worketh by love. It's just saying that the faith that we have uh, keeps us uh, uh, serving the Lord. Uh, rather than needing these dead, these dead letter of the law. So I, I just want to address that because it's very sneaky how some people will take a verse that's beautiful and about us uh, serving the Lord and having living and profitable faith uh, and turn it into a, a works. They'll, they'll put works in it uh, to make it seem like faith in what Christ did isn't enough, that it's this faith that worketh by love that is adding works to keep this getting us saved. You get what I'm saying? Sure. And it's, it's very sneaky. And I wanted to address that because we believe in faith that worketh by love, because that's what it's the love of Christ that constrains us. It's what keeps us uh, serving the Lord and our eyes on Christ. Uh, so, you know, I, I think it's just a misunderstanding of these people that think just because we're saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, and we're secure in that, that somehow it's a cloak for iniquity. It's a license to say it's a cloak for iniquity. You love your sin. It's just the most carnal misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. of When you get that gift, when you get the revelation that because somebody was saying just because you have to do something for a gift doesn't mean it's not a gift. Yes, it does. That's exactly what it means. If you have to do something for a gift, it's not a gift anymore. You've earned it. So uh, it's very important that we define these things and not let any sneaky uh, man's human merit get wrapped up in it. Amen. Amen, Renee. Yes, amen. Um, okay, I'm going to go to verse 10 now. Whose turn is it first? It's me. All right, brother. In the KJV, verse 10 reads, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Beautiful. So, for we are his workmanship. So, we're being, uh, in my opinion, we're being made into the likeness of Christ. Our our soul is being uh, changed. Our our spirit has already been quickened. Our spirit, I believe, is perfect. Uh, that uh, Paul uh, says in other verses that it can't sin. I mean that that spirit that he's quickened, that's inside us. It's impossible for that spirit to sin. What sins is our flesh, and our soul, our uh, mind, will, and emotions. That's what. Uh, I believe is is being worked on. We're in the process of uh, being made, uh, and that's uh, we're His workmanship. I mean, He does the work uh, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Now, this is where this could get twisted, where people focus on the works instead of the fact that it it's all what God did. So it says, "Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them." Uh, I, I believe that means that uh, because of uh, God knew us, he, he knew what we would do, and he uh, ordained that good work should be done, that we should walk in them. That's that, that's part of it. it, it that's not what saves us, uh, but a, a believer should. It says should there, uh, and I haven't checked to see the Greek word and equivalent to make sure that the translators got it right, but I do take it uh, for what it means, and plus in, in the context of the whole of Scripture. So it's talking about the works are ordained. Uh, it's, it's not some, uh, maybe, Brother Luke, you can say how the Calvinists uh, uh, twist this one. But it's to me, it's it's in reference to what, they're ta what he's talking about in verse 8. Uh, 
I'm sorry, verse nine, not of works. So this is still in the same subject. Verse nine says not, not of works. So he's talking more about the works. He said what it's not first, and now he's saying what it is, that the works are, are uh, ordained that we should walk in them uh, from the beginning. Yes, amen. All right, um, let's, uh, oh, Renee, uh, you don't need the the amplifier. So go ahead, tell us verse 10, your thoughts on that. All righty, let me pull this up. All right, here, this is what I love when he goes right into, look, you're not saved by works, but we are his workmanship. Mm. We're, we're uh, clay in his hands once we're saved. And our purpose our purpose once we're saved see I, I want people to get this salvation is just the beginning that's a done deal mm. finished by jesus christ and the reason we're still here and the lord didn't just snatch us away and take us to heaven right after we were saved is because the children of god are supposed to be a light to the world so if you are not serving the lord it's a wasted life that there's no you're not serving your purpose and i'm telling you you'll never feel fulfilled as long as you're not serving him so this is important to understand uh first things first you're saved by grace through faith and what jesus already did it is not faith that worketh by love it is not you faith without works is dead and you're doing these works and you might get it at the end salvation's finished and it's done based on jesus and what he did and so that's out of the way Okay, our permanent standing is in Christ. Where, as we were talking about earlier, we're already seated in heavenly places. Amen. Now, once we're saved, we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which mm -hmm. God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Like Brother Luke was saying, should versus must. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Paul did not lie. Silas did not lie. You put your faith on Jesus and what he did, and you will be saved. And once you do, you have passed from death to life. But now you're still here. So it's, I'm saved. Now what? Well, you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. What does it say? Uh, created Christ Jesus unto good works. So here's the key you are saved unto good works. The purpose is for his good work to be done in you manifested inside out we work out our salvation with fear and trembling we serve with fear and rejoice with trembling so we work that inner salvation outward so it can be in service of god so the should here is that we should walk in them we are saved unto good works but not by those good works so this is important division here for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But we are saved unto good works. And that's why it says we are his workmanship. Hmm. So it's not any of your works getting you saved. Right. He wants to do his work in you once you are saved. Amen. Yes, very good points made. Uh, all right. Um, let me see. I'm going to read it in the Amplified. Uh, verse 10 in the Amplified says, um, For we are his workmanship, uh, that is, his own master work, a work of art, created in Christ Jesus, that is, reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, ready to be used. Four good works, which God prepared for us beforehand, taking paths which he set so that we would walk in them, that is, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us. Well, I think they did an excellent job of uh, expanding the and amplifying the, the, the meaning of the verses. But uh, uh, to me, the the... the what we have here in these three verses is really the answer to the question is, uh, what's the purpose of works? Right. Uh, in, in eight and nine, it tells us uh, the purpose of works is not for salvation. 
And then verse 10 says, the purpose of works is after you're saved to have God use you and for you to fill your, I like the way Renee said it, your, uh, fulfill your purpose in life. Yeah. That was beautiful. We're I mean, salt and light, correct? We're salt yeah. and light. We're a light to the world. Amen. We're salt to preserve God's ways. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I believe uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, if people are arguing about works and, and, and salvation, uh, uh, you just say, well, uh, if you want to know uh, the relationship between works and salvation, you go to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. In 8 and 9, it tells us that works are not to get salvation. But in verse 10, it tells us works are uh, for us as believers to fulfill our purpose in life. God wants us to get busy working for the cause of Christ. And who knows? Who knows? I, I, I We can only imagine what God plans has for us to work in throughout eternity. I mean, gosh, what in the world has he got up his sleeve for us to do throughout eternity? I don't know, but it says it's gonna. It, it, if we can think of it, it's beyond that. You might as well just consider if if you can imagine it, it's it's way better than that. Amen, amen. So, uh, but I like the idea of we are His workmanship. Uh, you know, in other words, uh, um, He's He does the work to transform us. I, I've often said to people uh, that. Uh, uh, you, you can't make someone believe. Uh, all you can do is tell them the gospel, and then it's between them and and, uh, and Jesus. Uh, yeah. What will they do with Jesus? Uh, embrace him as their sa Savior and God and and uh, be, receive the gift of eternal life? Uh, it's between them and Jesus after that. We can't coerce them. We can't persuade them. We can hopefully answer questions and help them, but it's between them and Jesus. And then the next question is, okay, now that they've uh, believed and they, they're a child of God and they, they're loving and serving and worshiping and praising Jesus as we are, huh, well, what, uh, 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 how do they grow and mature and become productive? Is uh, That's between them and the Holy Spirit. It's not for us to make someone become a productive Christian. We, 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 it's not our job to uh, to uh, make them get busy working. We can we can tell them, hey, God's got work for you to do, not for your salvation, but it's a it, boy, what a privilege that yeah. God God has you in His workforce and He wants to use you. Reasonable service. What? Reasonable service. Sorry, I interrupted. Yeah, yes, it's our reasonable service. What? Come on. It, God has promised you eternal life in a perfect body that will never get sick or old. And all for all eternity, you're filled with joy and peace and ecstasy. And isn't it our reasonable service then to, to serve the cause of Christ? It's a privilege. It's an honor. It's, a, it's, it's not a, a, um, a laborious. It's a labor of love that we, we do once we are, are saved. Uh, all right, I forgot where I was going with that. But all right, anybody want to say more about uh, verse ten? Ben, do you want to say anything about verse ten? Uh, nope, you guys covered it well. There's uh, didn't have anything anything in the Greek that uh, was particularly interesting or uh, right. revealing that the English doesn't already say. Okay, well, just interrupt and assert yourself that you do want to add anything. Okay. okay uh, all right. Uh, shall we go on to verse eleven? Ready? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, it's Renee's turn. Yeah. Let me read 11 and see if I need to go any further or not here. Uh, Renee, verse 11 in the KJV says, oh, my God. Oh, I'm sorry. I just looked at the time. <laughs> Brother Cripps, what happened? Well, we started like 10 minutes late. I don't mind staying a little bit late. Oh, oh, okay. All right. So let's plan, on, let's plan on going like 10 minutes later than usual. Then. So we got 20 minutes left. But it's okay with me too. The time is, uh, it's it's flying by faster every t every study. This is, I, I needed this today. This is this is this has been wonderful. Yeah. All right, brother. So we're going to go to verse 11 now. Uh, Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, 
being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. 11 and 12, whose turn is it? It's Renee. Okay, go ahead, Renee. Yeah, you know, this reminds me when Paul was talking about, uh, he was warning <laughs> the uh, Jews, you know, you're, the Gentiles have been grafted in to the branch, right? And that if they uh, they have been broken off, some of the Jews have, or Hebrew people, because of unbelief. But if they believe, they'll be grafted right back in. So God has one people. The remnant of believing Israel right now and the Gentiles that believed. One new man in Christ. Uh, and so when we were under a new and better covenant now, not through God's not dealing with them as through genealogy, that was only for the Messiah to be born. So he was dealing with a peculiar people, the 12 tribes of Israel, based on Abraham's descendants, physical descendants, because they were chosen, the elect were chosen for the savior of the world to be born through. And so they were set apart people and the laws and their feasts, everything pointed to Jesus. It was all a shadow. And so when he's saying, wherefore remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, meaning they were not one of the 12 tribes of Israel. They were uh, considered pagans. They, they were not uh, in the nation of Israel who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hand. So I, I, I like here how he's not elevating the Jews here. Mm -hmm. He's actually saying that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. He's telling you right there that fleshly circumcision profits nothing. And he holds none of it in esteem. Mm -hmm. he's not holding in esteem. He's merely calling it what it is. You were the uncircumcision and they were circumcision, but we're talking about flesh here. That at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, uh, meaning that they didn't have the benefit of knowing God, like Israel had a relationship with God prior to this. And again, the unbelievers are cut off. They've been temporarily, it said, God forsake his people, they should fall, God forbid. But for now, they're blinded for a while. But there's a remnant, the commonwealth of Israel, meaning all the benefits of knowing the true and living God through Christ and strangers from the covenants of promises, uh, covenants of promise. G Jesus came to confirm the promises made to the fathers. It says that. Uh, so they, the Gentiles, they didn't have any covenants of promise. They didn't know anything about the promised savior. Uh, so he's just confirming that the Gentiles, you guys, didn't have the scriptures you didn't have any prophecies of him coming you had no relationship with the living god uh and that's what you were you were aliens from the commonwealth of israel and strangers from the covenants of promise having no hope and without god in the world so it was just confirming the state they were in before they came to christ how far away from god they were they weren't it, it israel at least had the law and the prophets they had promises. They had covenants. They knew who the living God was. But the Gentiles, they didn't know who he was. They had no covenants with him. They had no promises from him. They were completely alienated from him. And so he's just reminding them of how devastating their, their position was mm. before they got to, to know Jesus. Awesome. Yep, awesome. I'm going to read... Uh... 11 and 12 uh, in the Amplified Brother Cripps. Uh, okay. Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles by birth, who are called uncircumcision by those who called themselves circumcision, itself a mere mark, which is made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that at that time, you were separated from Christ, that is, excluded from any relationship with him, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, 
with no share in the sacred messianic promise and without knowledge of God's agreements, having no hope in his promise and living in the world without God. Wow, that sounds so sad and depressing. Yeah, yeah it, <laughs> it is. I mean, I, I, I'm glad I don't have to, to try to imagine it. Again, by, by his grace, I do know God. Uh, and it's it's not from any merit I have in myself. I don't know how to make that any more clear. It's, it's because of his great mercy and great love uh, that that's even uh, possible. Um, I don't think I can do a better job than uh, Renee and also the Amplified. I think it, it explains that very well. But the bottom line is it's not the physical circumcision that does anything. And the other thing is that that, that is an accurate, in my opinion, that's an accurate depiction of where the Gentiles were uh, by birth, as the Amplified uh, says. Um, but again, uh, in God's great mercy, he included the Gentiles. And I believe he already decided that before he uh, even made the world and knew exactly uh, what his plan was. Uh, but in, in time, in our time, that's what it was. The, the Hebrews were God's chosen people. Everyone else was a was a Gentile, and there's a lot of other words that are way worse than that, dogs and pigs or, or whatever, whatever the case may be. Um, but again, because of his great mercy and grace, uh, he opened up the doors uh, for all the Gentiles, and a lot of them uh, believed. And they listened to Paul, and they listened, listened to the uh, apostles when they uh, started their churches. Uh, I liked how the Amplified says, excluded from any relationship with him. Um, so uh, I guess they would say that they didn't have any opportunity uh, for that. But then uh, uh, Abraham, uh, Abraham was, uh, in my understanding, a uh, pagan. And uh, uh, God um, worked in his life and he, he came to believe in him. And then uh, he does that with all of us now. I mean, uh, from the beginning of time, it was always his plan. Um, and I'm, I'm just grateful that last verse in the Amplified doesn't apply to me. Uh, that would be hopeless. That, that's the best way I know how to say it, that uh, without God, being in this world, in this broken, fallen world without God, I cannot imagine what that would feel like. I, I just can't. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, the, I think the world as a whole, the thought of them being estranged from God uh, wouldn't bother them in the least. <laughs> it probably, many people would be quite happy with that. Right. But really, the, the, the thought, I hope all of us have this thought that that's the most depressing thing I can imagine. Yeah. And having God's not in my life, that would be horrible. Uh, but I don't have any more to say about those verses. You guys covered everything you need. To. So I'll, I'll go to the next verse, uh, 13. Whose turn is it to go first? It's me. Okay. Uh, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Wow. Yeah, so where they didn't, uh, according to Paul in the verses above, where they didn't have an opportunity before, they were separated or cut off from God through Christ, the offering of Christ, again, for reconciliation with God. Uh, they're, they're draw, they draw nigh because of what he did on the cross. Uh, absolutely. Uh, so again, it's open to everyone instead of just God's chosen people. That is the that is the thing that uh, calls us. The calls us is what Christ did, and that we can come to Him through faith and grace. All right, thank you. All right, Sister Renee. All righty. Verse thirteen. Yes. Hold up. But now, yeah. You were saying it's so depressing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you guys, you guys are in bad shape. That's basically what he was saying. Like, you guys are in trouble. Yeah. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made die by the blood of Christ. So you guys were way far away from God or knowing him or having any hope. But now you've been brought close to God through Jesus. Mm. How awesome is that? 
Super awesome. But he did a good job in those two verses. Going, oh, it's like you pagan, uncircumcised. What what did he say? Uh, remember, you uh, being in times past, Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcised. At that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of providence, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, who sometimes were far off, are made not by the blood of Christ. So he, he really set that up so that the good news sounded great, didn't it? Yeah. Oops. Okay. Uh, forgot, Crips. Did you do thirteen yet? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, I know so, uh, let me let me read thirteen in the Amplified and see if it adds anything. Not adding to the scriptures, but adding into our understanding of the scriptures. Right. Um, um, but now, at this very moment, in Christ Jesus, you who once were so very far away from God, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You know, uh, we talked about, um, or I, I mentioned earlier, this video by uh, Brother Merle. Uh, uh, someone did post the name of the channel again. It's, uh, gosh, why do I keep forgetting it? But uh, Brother Merle's video is talking about uh, uh, this, uh, the gospel and the um, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, uh, the simplifying it all. And uh, to me, uh, that, uh, that is the key. It, it, we've got to realize that it's simple and not make it complicated. But uh, this verse here, I, I, I think it simplifies as about as much as you possibly could. Uh, all it says here uh, as a, um, uh, the, the point is making is, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh, they're made nigh, how? Well, is there a is there a paragraph? Is there a chapter? Is there an, there an entire book that goes on to explain how 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 this <laughs> happened? No, there is a phrase by the blood of Christ. Period. Okay, so that's the simplicity. That is the um, the gospel in as few words as possible. That's why that hymn. Nothing but the blood is so perfect. Uh, right now, imagine that you die and you're before God and God's judging you. And God says, why should I let you into heaven? Well, most people are going to answer it the way that Jesus said, uh, <laughs> this is the wrong answer. He says, there's going to come a day where people come before me and say, Lord, Lord, look at all the wonderful things we did in your name. And they start boasting about all their religious works, saying uh, they, they're, they want to be justified before God. But by uh, They think they can impress God with all the wonderful works that they did. Um, uh, and yet, really, the only answer that would satisfy God in that situation is this. The blood of Christ is my plea. That's my only plea. Jesus has shed blood. I'm reliant on what he did for me and his promise that that's enough. Amen. All right. Um, okay, so I guess we got about five minutes now to kind of give our, our summary and, and remarks here. Uh, let's start with Brother Ben, since we heard the least amount from you, Brother. I appreciate what you did on verses 8 and 9. That was very good. Uh, but give us your uh, your feedback on the entire study tonight, Ben. Well, I just thought the whole chapter was sweeter than honey. I mean, th this is so edifying. Um, and uh, I, like Crip like, like said earlier, I needed this as well. So um, Praise God. Uh, yeah, it, it, that was really, really great to be with you guys tonight. Mm -hmm. Thanks, awesome. Ben. Awesome. Okay, Brother Cripps, you get to go next. Yeah, well, I, I, I agree with Ben. That shouldn't uh, be any huge surprise. Uh, uh, this this was a great verse. I did did need it tonight, as I said, and I, I could could feel the uh, feel the ointment, the soothing balm of His Word tonight uh, in this study. I just uh, am so glad that that I was uh, able to be here and. Uh, uh, read these verses with everyone. 
And I'm glad that we had time to talk about these uh, very important verses that are uh, often twisted and misunderstood. Uh, and uh, I might be missing some, but it seems like we all agree that the verses 8 and 9 are, are, um, are about uh, salvation. And uh, I, think, I think we made good points about that. And uh, the, other, the other point I think uh, Paul is making, uh, going further to say that it's not about works and, and how it is that we come to him. And it's, it, we come to him uh, not of ourselves at all, but because of the blood of Christ and what he did on the cross. That's what, that's what saves us. Um, uh, we, we don't boast in our works. Uh, there's nothing in our works. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. And I believe that. I, I, I firmly believe that. So uh, any, any gift I have from God is from him, and it's not from me. And I want it to be from him. I don't want any, any part of me to stand for anything when it comes uh, to me uh, going to heaven and, and being with him for eternity. I want it to all be him, and it is. Yeah, we can shout amen to that, brother. Uh, all right. Uh, let's get a summary uh, and, uh, from our untwisted sister, uh, also, uh, you have any announcement on Thursday? No, uh, I'm taking some time off of Thursday's program just for a little bit till I get some stuff settled. Jim's got, I, I need to go on, stuff's going on with Jim's school and other stuff. So I'm just going to take it easy right now. I'm editing together an important video and we have this on Sunday. So I'm going to postpone Thursdays for a while. Uh, but I'll be back. I just don't know when. Um, but... I wanted to say, I, I think this section of Ephesians, although it's one of the most quoted, is also one of the most important. Uh, I love the fact that when we're talking about Christ, already seen it in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And I like how you saw that. And regardless, I see it as literally, we are already there in Christ. Mm. And so, I mean, again, to lose salvation, you have to drag us out of heaven. And there's so many impossible things you'd have to do to lose your salvation. Uh, I also love how, how desperate Paul tells us we are before Christ. Like, people don't realize without Jesus, that's why all these religions, Islam, Buddhism, that's them alienated nowhere near God no hope dead. that's them now that's why we preach this gospel it's so important Jesus said preach the gospel to every creature they are dead they are without hope I mean you hear that you guys they yeah. are without hope they are aliens of God and there's no need for it the ministry of reconciliation is the gospel and what grieves me is there's so many professing christians coming against the message of reconciliation in christ and the world needs it right now you know what my pastor i sent my pastor this silly little wolf thing right the picture and i said <laughs> silly because there's people with channels called exposing renee roland the wolf in sheep's clothing etc right. with the sheep and wolf's clothing and he said, it was prophesied, Renee. They would call evil good and good evil. They're calling the message that I preach, you guys, the same one you preach, the gospel of grace, the grace of Christ, the greatest news ever, the message of the reconciliation we have because of Jesus' sacrificial death, burial, and resurrection. It's being called a lie of the serpent. And he said, they, they said, that good would be called evil and evil is called good, but keep preaching it at them because it's their only hope. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. And so, you know, when people come in here like that little boy, Justin, he's come in here the last couple of weeks accusing me, but they're not his words. They're the words of Watchman D. He's been listening to this false teacher and he comes in accusing and using verses out of context. We need to show him kindness and show him the truth of the gospel. We're not promoting sin. We don't make much of uh, uh, little of sin. We make much of Jesus. I like when Daniel said that. We don't make little of sin. We make much of Jesus. And so they, he needs to hear that gospel. 
he needs to hear that message. So we need to show a little, little more patience. I know it's easy to get defensive because I mean, hey, he was coming at me, calling me names. But the bottom line is, I'm willing to take that. I'm willing to do it because we have to be a little more patient. Like Luke's friend said, dead men don't get offended. And so if I get myself out of the way, I can say, hey, pray for this guy. Not in wow. some, not in some like uh, uh, holier than thou. I'm good for you. I'm not saying it like that. I mean, seriously, pray for this guy that his eyes be open so he gets free. He's a young kid, you know, that he gets free. And so I think we need to realize uh, we died, get ourselves out of the way. And this message of by grace we can save through faith, not of yourself, is a gift of God, not of work. And to both be free. I really enjoyed the study tonight. I really appreciated uh, what Nori was saying about the, uh, uh, the the word tenses and the gender specifics in the Greek. That's, that's amazing. You know, in English, we don't really have that. In Spanish, we do. I, I found it interesting that uh, mission in Spanish is a feminine word, the word for church. Uh, it should be. Um, uh, what is it? Mission Viejo. Yeah, they use a uh, Mission Viejo. It's a town in Southern California, but Viejo is a masculine form of old. It should have been Vieja because it's a feminine thing. So when you um, hear that Greek, Corny Greek has the same feminine, masculine, it's just fascinating. And then Ben showing the breakdown like that. It's just, I learned so much from you guys. I'm, I'm just so happy to be here. And I'm sorry I ran you late. My pastor went a little long tonight. That's okay. It was worth it. It was worth it, Renee. Amen. Yeah, okay. All right. But, uh, you you know, we can't ignore the fact that you were a little late. So there may be some disciplinary, disciplinary action required. We'll have to discuss that. My knuckles with a ruler, like a good nun, like a good <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Well, the, as far as the study tonight, it was just a wonderful. But of course, all the time we spend together, I very rarely have, I can't recall programs where it wasn't a blessing like this. But um, of course, the certain scriptures we covered tonight were uh, some of the most important that uh, we'll ever talk about. Uh, but um, let me see, uh, since you're not going to have your program Thursday, Renee, uh, I guess uh, uh, the next uh, thing I'd ask people to do is uh, make sure you join us Friday on this same channel, 930 Eastern Time. Uh, it, it's called Fun Fellowship Friday. And why do we call it uh, that, Brother Cripps? Uh, because it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> because it's so much fun. That's right. Yeah, get some enthusiasm, brother. <laughs> so uh, join us Friday for that. And uh, I guess uh, let me just also, uh, for those of you who do not know Brother Nori uh, in, in the chat room here, uh, I'm so happy to have him back in the, the congregation participating. So please, everybody, make sure you subscribe to Brother Nori's channel. And that other channel I mentioned, uh, uh, Brother Merle's channel, uh, Maybe, Nora, you can post uh, the, the links to yours and uh, uh, Brother Merle's channels there. And I would encourage everybody to uh, subscribe and, and check out their, uh, their videos, uh, especially that recent one from Brother Merle about the, the, uh, making it simple. Um, all right. I guess that's uh, it uh, as far as the program tonight. Uh, thank you, everybody, for spending time with us. The fellowship was wonderful, and I think we all learned something tonight. So... Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.